was done. That's the best way. What I plan to do on the Tuesday, or Thursdays rather, is spend at least a few minutes sitting down, seeing what you're working on, offering some advice and suggestions. Um, of, of course I'll be available for any kinds of questions, but I guess what I'm saying is I want to spend, a, I want to commit, because this isn't a big plant, to spend a, a, a fixed amount of time or a certain amount of time with each person just to see what they're doing. And if, if you haven't done anything since the last class, you know, just say, I haven't done anything, you know. It's, it's not like you're being checked or graded for this. It's just that I want to make sure that I go out and check to see what um, you're working on so I can offer any advice for, for whatever problems that you're running into. All right. Um, what, what I want to do today is I want to revisit the photographer app I had that had the custom view because I, if I am not mistaken, last time I got an air trying to run it or something, and um, I re-imported it, and it seems okay. It, it's hard for me to identify exactly what went wrong there, but I do want to take some time to look at that, and then we will look at the, um, our next application. Um, as you're working through the applications, remember, uh, I'm a big fan of just doing a piece at a time. So if you're having trouble with something, you know, get as much going as you can. And even if you hard code something in that later, like if you know, work in a rock, paper, scissors, if you have a hard time generating um, the, the computer's choice, just have it automatically throw rock every time. All right, just to get that tested. Then once you get past that hurdle, you can continue. So to repeat, Tuesdays is going to be, as we have been doing, uh, a mixture of lecture and lab. Thursdays will be all lab, and I will devote a certain amount of time to each person, just seeing where they're at, what they need to do, and, and then go from there. So I want to check in with everyone. I guess that's a good way to put it, um, at least on Thursdays. Um, and, of course, to, to answer any questions that, they, that you would have. All right. So we are looking at what we looked at last time that I had problems running, and that was my custom view. And if we can if I can There we go. I didn't, I didn't change the name of the app, which is my, my. You notice those are two images which have a watermark over them. Again, the idea here is that the standard views within Android is a standard image view. And we want to uh, alter that to make a watermarked image view. So I make a custom view that inherits from image view, then it's an image view that can do other things as well. Again, think of that when you um, think of inheritance is that it is a member of the superclass, but it's a more specialized version of the superclass. So it has special powers, if you will. All right? Or it might do some things differently. That's another possibility. All right. For example, the tuition for a graduate student might be calculated differently than for uh, an undergrad student. So you might have a student class and then inherit from that a graduate student class that um, does everything that a student does but does some things differently, namely calculates tuition or whatever. So that's what we had. And again, to show this, since we were having trouble with it last time, I have my layout consisting of two of these guys.
and it's a relative layout. And again, where we would normally have things like image view or otherwise, since this, since this is my custom view, I need to put the package name followed by the class name up here in the, H, uh, in the uh, XML tag. <coughs> now, notice also <coughs> I developed a namespace. Yes? So that's just instead of like putting text view up there. Like instead of putting text view in there, I put the, the, the package name and my classes view. Right. So normally, <coughs> if I was just using a regular old-fashioned image view, I'd just have image view there. <coughs> now, notice that I think we did not mention this uh, last time. Notice up in this, I developed uh, an XML namespace. All right? A namespace is a way of qualifying things. All right? The best example I can give of a namespace is let's say you had a furniture company that was um, that, that had a database, all right, <laughs> and you're writing an application for that furniture company that accesses the database. Table can obviously mean two different things in that context. I can either talk about the the piece of furniture that's called a table, or I can talk about the database structure called a table. I might have classes for both of those. All right. The namespace is a way to qualify and to say, hey, when I use this namespace, I am talking about the furniture things. And when I use this, I'm talking about the database things. So it's a way to qualify that. Where it comes into play here is some of these attributes on my custom view have the MZ namespace in front of it so as it will not interfere with if there happens to be an Android X or Y. Alright? So for example, I do believe there is an Android X and Y for things that relate to the position on the screen or something. I don't know. Uh, I do recall seeing that. Or there might be if there isn't. But is a namespace. Right. So again, that qualifies. This means I'm talking about my X, not the, the built-in to the Android framework if there happened to be an X attribute. I declare the namespace up here. Up here in the, um, in the tag itself. In the, 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 the tag for the layout itself. So notice that we've used this from probably the first application we've looked at where we've given properties to our views. All right? And we use always the standard Android properties. You know, when the first Hello World example we gave, there was, you know, our drawable um, of the image of the little bug and the little Android robot and, and all that stuff. But here, in addition to that, I'm passing my attributes that are distinct to my view there. So, and I have three of them. The X, Y, and the watermark size. And so, the question you might have is how does that get into my class? Or how does that get into my object? Well, If you notice, in the constructor for this guy, I call the super, and that sets the normal Android attributes. I get past the attribute set, the attribute set being effectively all this stuff, all these attributes get passed to the superclasses method. In this case, it's the image views method. And in that way, all the regular Android stuff gets set. The SRC, the ID, the layout width, the layout height, and so on. All that gets set. 
I then call this uh, um, this uh, uh, the, the subclasses set attributes. Pass it the same thing. I take those attributes, create a typed array from it, and I pull from it. those particular values, the watermark size, the X, and the Y. And I give some defaults if they're not present. So in other words, the, the watermark size, if I don't pass one, it gets a value of 10. All right, if I don't pass one in here. So what does this code do? This code takes my attributes that I define specific to my custom view and uses those attributes that were in the XML to set the attributes associated with this class all right, that I've defined. So that's how it gets, that's how the stuff from the XML file gets into this. When this guy gets inflated, when that um, XML layout file gets inflated and actually creates the page and creates all the objects, when it creates these guys, it passes those attributes, those XML attributes to this method and this method plucks out those individual attributes and pops them in the instance variables for that object. This has a specific meaning. Now, let's, let's look to see if an image view does have an XY attribute. Because I just, I just, I said it probably did off the top of my head, but I, I guess I don't know that for a fact. As it turns out, it does not have an X attribute. But that really doesn't matter. Because it could. And if we go and look at this, maybe a view has an X attribute. Okay, a uh, view, um, let's see, I haven't gotten to the X. A view does not have an X attribute. But again, that doesn't matter. The idea is, is this X and Y doesn't relate, or what it relates to is it relates to the position of the watermark on the image. All right? So in other words, you see the watermark here that says copyright Mike Zellers. Maybe there it's easier to see. The X and Y from the XML file set the X and Y of the watermark. So it's specific to my class. All right? The regular view doesn't have a watermark associated with it. So it, it doesn't have to find an attribute for that. So I defined it and I gave it my namespace so that it's clear that that's an attribute relating to my class. And, and so I can handle it. So it doesn't mean the X and Y on the screen, all right, which apparently isn't a property, but it means the X and Y position of the watermark on that. And that's distinct to my class. So that's why I do that. The other thing I do is I override the onDraw event. All right? And the onDraw event is what actually paints the screen. All right? So when we display an image view, it's that image view's on draw event that fires off. And 
Later on, when we do the doodle application, we'll play around with this, the on-draw method quite a bit. But this is a good introduction to it. Because that on-draw method gets set several times based on several actions. One of the actions, of course, is when the, when, the, when the page is first created, when the screen's first created. It does the on draw to draw all the controls that are on it, or it draws all the views that are on it. There's other times that it happens too, like if you're doing something interactive, like drawing using a doodle application, you tell it when you want to redraw the screen. Like after I make a motion or after I draw a shape with my finger, through the code I can tell it to go and redraw the screen. All right. But in this case, this is going to fire up automatically when, when it's created, the on-draw method for it. And again, notice what we do here. We first call the supers on-draw to just draw the regular image, right? Because remember, this we want this to extend the image view. We want it to do everything that an image view does plus some extra stuff. If we just overrode that method, we wouldn't actually draw the image ever. In other words, if I commented this line out, we wouldn't draw the image at all. We'd just draw the watermark. All right? What I want to do, though, is I want to do what the regular image view does when you draw it, plus I want to do my drawing of drawing the watermark. So therefore, I call super on draw. That draws the image like regular. I then do in my little extra bit of drawing. And that is I create a paint, paint brush or paint uh, class. I set the colors for it. Um, the colors are uh, it's the ARGB format, which is um, alpha or opacity. Um, a number from 0 to 255. 255 would be completely solid. 0 would be completely transparent. So this is towards the solid end of the spectrum because it's bigger than 128. 255, 255, 255. That's white, all right, because everything's turned all the way up. This is a particular style for the paint. This is the text size, which I get from my attribute. And then I draw the text. Where do I draw it? In X, Y. That's those attributes that are distinct. That's what I got from the XML file, the X and Y attribute for this, uh, using that paintbrush. No, paint is a predefined class. I just declared a, an instance of the paint class called P. You're talking about this statement? Yeah. Well, what does this statement do? This statement does two things. It creates a variable, which is P. And that's not an abbreviation for paint. Well, it could be anything. I mean, I picked P because that's the first letter of paint, and it made it clear to me what it was, but it, it doesn't by necessity have to be P. Yeah, what I'm doing, let, let, let's, let's break it down and look at this one step at a time. I'm not creating anything, except, well, I am creating an object. So I'm creating an object, and I'm then calling methods on the object. No, the method is called set ARGB, -A set style, set textile. So, the class is called paint. So, if I have this statement, paint p equals new paint. All right. This actually is sort of two statements combined. All right. I'm going to break it down into the two statements that this is combined. All right, and then we can look at it together. I'm trying to answer that for you. All right. So if I say paint P, 
The two statements that this translates to is paint P and P equals new paint. All right. So this is the same as these two statements. It's just combined into one. Paint P, what that does is that creates a variable, which again, because this is an object reference variable, is containing a pointer that's going to point to something in the heap. Initially, though, this line simply says, I have a variable P that at some point in the future is going to point to a paint object. All right? That's what paint P means. I have a variable called P that at some point is going to point to a paint object. That is an object of the class paint. But that's, that paint there is well, it's not a reserve word, it's the name of a class. But it's part of Android. Yes, it's a class that's defined as, as part of, of Android. All right? So, I have a class called paint. I have a variable called P. And that variable P is going to point to an instance of the class paint at some time in the future. It doesn't do that yet, but it will. So what this is doing effectively, again, in this is where you know sometimes, you know sometimes we try to abstract things and not think on a nuts and bolts level. But this is where I think you really got to think on a nuts and bolts level of, of what this is actually doing to the memory. And what this is doing is this is creating a memory location called P that initially doesn't point to anything. All right? Because we've simply said, I have a variable called P. We're going to put a pointer to a paint object in here, but not yet. This, strictly speaking, is what is called the stack, as opposed to the heap. The heap is where objects live. All right. The stack goes, um, for example, um, what would you call these? Uh, procedural variables. In other words, variables that are declared within a procedure goes in the stack. Which in this case, that's what, that's what P is. P is a variable that we declare in this procedure. So, that's what line one does. Again, I'm in, the, in, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to answer that for you. All right? We just covered the first part of it. All right? The first part says of paint P, in other words, this part of that does this. Now, what does P equals new paint do? And what is paint with a empty parentheses? Paint with empty parentheses is, is calling a constructor on the paint class. Which constructor is it calling on the paint class? It's calling the constructor that has no arguments. Hence, there's nothing between the parentheses. So the paint on the right side of the equation, in this case, is calling the paint constructor. An object or a class can have a bunch of paint constructors. Three, to be specific. One creates a new paint object with default settings. One creates it with some specified flags. All right, so you can initialize some values, some attributes in it. And one is you can copy one paint object into another. So you can, you can call it. Can, what do constructors do? Constructors make an instance of that class. Constructors are what construct or make an object. So. If we look at this line now, what we're doing is when we see the word new, 
New says make a new object. What kind of object? Well, a paint object and make it by calling the paint objects constructor that has no arguments. So this side says make a new object. What kind of object? A paint object. How am I going to make it? By calling the constructor that has no arguments. So this side makes a new object on our heap. And it has some memory location associated with it. I don't know, it doesn't matter, but there's, it's, it's so located somewhere in the heap. The second part of the statement says, store the pointer to that object in the variable p. So now p has a pointer, whatever that memory location is, that points to this object on the heap. So that's what the second half of the statement does. This simply declares an instance variable. This simply declares a variable and it says what we're going to put into it. New creates an object. This is the kind of object it's going to create and this is which constructor we're going to call. So if you're, if you're looking for um, nouns here, all right. It would be like this. Class variable equals new class constructor. And that would be the general form of that statement. The class, again, is a template. This produces an object. And a pointer to the object gets stuffed in the variable. So now, after either this statement, which again, this is just sort of shorthand to just do everything in one swoop. It declares a variable and initializes it in one swoop. This declares a variable and initializes it in two steps. So this simply does that in one terse step. But the end result's the same. We get a new object that gets pointed to by this variable. How did the object get, got, get created? It got created by calling the no argument constructor. Okay. Now, to continue your question, now we have a statement that looks like this. How dare another teacher use the paper in my room? I'll tell you the nerve. We have a statement that looks like this. Immediately following that, we have this statement. Immediately following p paint equals new paint, we have p set arg b 200, 255, 255. What that's doing is on the object called p, which is of type paint, we are calling the uh, um, um, we are calling the method or the function called set arg b, and we're passing it these parameters or these arguments. So to continue this, this is object dot function arguments. Yeah, it's it's the object. Yeah, it's the object. So the object that got created by this line we're calling the set argb function on that. But that p is the same as the Yes. 
we created the object called here. All right. The, uh, the reference to that object is called P. Then on that object, the object that is referred to by P, we call the method set ARGB. And then same with the other three methods or two methods or whatever. Exactly. In, in other words, there's already, you know, the whole idea of, of using this is it's a framework, all right, which means that, you know, real common things that are done, like drawing on the screen or drawing on a view or whatever, there's classes that handle that for you, all right? So it's a case of not reinventing the wheel. So um, theoretically, we probably could write our own paint class and we probably could write, but it's like, oh, why bother? You know, that, that would be a nightmare to do. All right. So what we do instead is we, we take advantage of the framework and we build on top of it. Then we can handle the stuff that we want to do that maybe isn't part of the general framework. So instead of having to worry about low level things like how do I write on an image, they've already given me methods to do that. I can then take that and build on top of that and create a watermarked image, which is something that they don't provide within the framework. So I write my custom code to sort of extend their framework. If I was doing an app for a photographer, watermarking images would be important. But not everyone's a, a, a photographer, right? So they don't build that in the framework automatically. That's a need specific to my application. So I develop custom views for things specific in my application, all right, uh, that take and, and are based off of the existing views because the existing views like give me a head start, you know. I, you know, if you look at this to accomplish that, you know, to accomplish the watermarked image, I really only have, you know, a handful lines of code. You know, I have maybe 40 lines of code, I mean, including blank lines, all right. To imagine to write that from scratch would be, you know, hundreds, thousands of lines of code. The reason is because I can jump start and just use that. Go ahead. I think I understand now better why you have a Right, right. Because the super declaration goes and, t and says, hey, do what you normally do when you're drawing an image view, and when you're done, let's come back and do these extra things. So if I got rid of that, let's see what would happen. If I commented that out, I think I know what's going to happen. Let's change this to red, though, because otherwise I fear it's not going to show up. By commenting out that line that says super, what do I get? I just get my watermark, right? Because I didn't tell it to go and do, go and draw an image view like I normally do, all right? I commented out the line that says super on Canvas Draw, all right? So therefore, it's not doing the normal stuff that's done when an image is drawn. It's just doing my stuff. And what's my stuff? Well, my stuff is just... Um, drawing a um, a watermark. All right, so that's why that's all it did in this case. So Android even thinks that it's probably a bad idea to do this. All right, they warn you. The warning here. Well, maybe not. All right. So now, if I if I fix it, now it will do the regular draw image, 
and then it will put the watermark on top of it. It's warning me, it's telling me that this paint should be declared somewhere else. And I guess, um, you know, I probably should put it in the constructor or something, but it's just a warning. It's allowing me to do it. So I'm not going to worry about it. And if we notice here, now that I uncommented that line of code out, I get both the, you're going to have to trust me here, but I get both the watermark and the uh, image. Let me go and change it to... Let me go and change this to solid white. And hopefully that will be visible. Now we're back in business with oops, with the watermark on there. So you can almost think of the canvas as sort of a well, a canvas, uh, uh, an overlay that you can draw on top of. All right. So you have our you have your view. That view has certain default looks on it, and we can go in and we can um, through the on draw event. If we extend the view, we can draw other stuff on it. So we're going to do this a lot on the um, uh, in some of the upcoming uh, applications. We're going to draw on the view, and we're going to do that using the canvas. All right. We could take a look real quick at some of the other methods that are set ARGB that sets the color of the paint brush. I, I guess I, in my mind, I think of this as like the paint brush, but um, you know, it, it obviously it's just you know it, it's an object. It doesn't exactly correspond to a paint brush. Um, there's a stroke style, or there, there's a style of the paint brush that we can look at. Stroke, fill and stroke, fill, different options as far as that. Okay. This relates more, this is more relevant when you are drawing geometric figures. Um, cause, so you, like, this would allow you to draw either a rectangle that was red and transparent in the middle or red and solid red in the middle. So you can go in and do that when you draw it. With text I don't think it's really relevant. And then finally we have the set text size and then we can call the draw text method on the canvas that draws this stuff, this text, in position X and Y, which was defined in the XML. You can get set the attributes here, and then we're using this paintbrush. So that's how that's why it's a particular color and in size that it is because we use this paintbrush. Questions, yeah. You, you could put a string in there, right? I you could draw whatever. I could put Oh, in other words, put this in the string file? Yeah. And just call this Yeah, file. in fact I, I should do that. that 
Repeat that, please. In this draw text? All right. The draw text isn't a constructor. We're not making an object. We're calling a method on the canvas object. The canvas object gets passed to us, so that's already been created elsewhere. But yeah. Um, well, let's look. There actually is four draw text methods. Okay. This is a good point of Annie to talk about a concept I don't think we visited yet, and that is the notion of function overloading. All right. What does it mean to overload a function? Okay, you're close. All right, that's probably a better way to put it. Overloading a function is where you have several sort of optional ways to call a function. Um, so, for example, if we look at the draw text, If we look at the draw text method, there's one method that accepts a string, an X and Y both float, and a paintbrush. That's the one that I used that, that takes four arguments. This one here takes actually what, one, two, three, four, five, six arguments. A character sequence, a starting and ending position, in other words, I want to, disp I want to draw position 5 through 10, for example. I don't want to draw the entire string, but positions 5 through 10 of it. And then X and Y position and a paint. This one does, draws the text. Um, let's see. Draws the text with origin and X, Y using the specific... I'm a little unsure about what that is draws a text. I think the, the start, the index and account, like I could specify starting at position 5 for 15 characters. All right. If you notice each one of these, the combination of arguments is unique. So if I overload a function, I can't have two functions that accept the same number and types of arguments. So if I have a function ABC that does something, all right, it doesn't matter what. I could have ABC that accepts no arguments. I could have ABC that accepts a string. I could have ABC that accepts an integer. I could have ABC that accepts a string and an integer. All right, but I couldn't have two versions of ABC that ex both accepted integers. Why? Because then it wouldn't know which one to call. Right? Which function call gets called, which version of the function that gets called, depends on which arguments you give it. So in other words, I call, I've given four arguments, a string, two floats, and a paint. Therefore, it knows to call this version of the function and not one of these other versions because the arguments match up with this version and not the other. This simply allows us to create defaults and to, to create a simple kind of, uh, simple kind of, uh, uh, variations or options in a method. You know, like for example, I could have a temperature conversion, you know, where I pass in a argument to it and by default it assumes I want to co uh, um, convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. But then I could have a second version of that function where I put in a temperature and what scale it's on and what scale I want the result in. 
So if I just, if I, you know, I can either call it and get those two other parameters defaulted, or I can give all three parameters and get the version of the function that does that. So again, it has for a little bit of flexibility in coding to, to overload that. But to answer your question, that's why it's not such an easier, easy answer to say, does it require four arguments? The particular version I called needs four arguments. But there's other versions of the function that either need a different number or different types of arguments than the four that I specified here. Here's a whole other things where we can draw text on a path. So if I wanted to have the copyright form a circle, for example, I could define a path and create a circle. And you're absolutely right. I should put this in a string, so let's go and do that. And let's delete all the other strings while we do that. Could you just call string welcome? Yeah. Yeah. Although I don't think I'm using that anywhere, so I probably could repurpose that guy. Now how do I, I'm going to change it to Michael so I know we're getting the string. How do I refer to the string in here? I say R, which means it's in my resources, dot string dot copyright. It's giving me an error. Why? Because I have not saved everything. Now I get an error on that. I think when I, I think, let's run it and see what happens. R dot Java was Does it automatically know that the string file is the string 
It should. I don't know what I'm doing wrong though. How do I get a string from resource using its name? I was getting the, I thought I just had to put our string copyright, but our string copyright simply is a pointer to the string in the string file, and therefore it's not itself a string, and therefore I have to use that code to get it to work. So, my, my mistake on that. Yeah, get in. Actually, I don't think I need this part. I think I can just say, or I stand corrected. I guess I do need that part. Okay. Now this has a clear advantage that if I wanted to um, put a copyright message in French or something else, I could simply create another resource file. I could create a values-fr and then have all the strings in there and that would work. Questions about any of this? All right, let's go up to lab then. Yeah. Can you see which? Yeah. Get resources. Paren dot get string. So Thursday we'll be up in lab from the start.